Good morning. Today's date is October 3rd, 2008. My name is Tyrone Bellinger. Today I will be conducting an oral history interview with Joseph Samick for the Veterans History Project in partnership with the Dalton Council on Aging. This interview is being held at the Dalton Community Television Studio in Dalton, Massachusetts. Good morning, Joe. Morning, Tyrone. <clears throat> Would you please state your full name and spell your last n name, please? Joseph Norton Samick. S A M E K. Where do you presently live? Pittsfield, Massachusetts. What is your date of birth and where were you born? January 30th, 1927 in New York City. Did you go to school and grow up, go to grow up and go to school there? Yes, I did. Uh, what school? Do you, any of the schools? Public in? school, uh, PS 190, uh, junior high school, PS 30, and Bronx High School of Science. Is there anything significant that you remember during your high school days? The biggest thing in high school was the fact that uh, uh, the, w the war had started, World War II had started, and uh, several of our teachers were drafted and were, or enlisted in the service. It was pretty hard for some of the students, I imagine. Yes, it was, because we ha wound up getting uh, shop teachers teaching us mathematics yes. and English, and it was a, uh, they did the best they could. Sure. What was life like growing up at that time during the Depression? I uh, really never thought that, that we were, had any problems in the Depression. My father always, we had a roof over our heads. We moved around a lot because we went to wherever the landlord gave the, nest, <laughs> the best concession in rent. Yeah. But uh, we always had enough to eat and we always had uh, clothes because uh, I had Older brothers, so I was wearing hand-me-downs. You got the second and third generation of clothes? Yes, yes. But, but uh, you lived basically comfortable. Yes, I would say that. I, didn't, I was unaware that there was really a depression. Yeah. I knew that we had some, pro some sort of a depression because they, in, in elementary school, uh, they gave out NRA stickers to stick on the windows. NRA? The National Recovery Administration that, they, that President Roosevelt had uh, oh, okay. inaugurated. Did you have brothers and sisters? I, I had uh, two older brothers. Were they in the military? Yes, they were. My oldest brother, Walter, was in the army. He was a pharmacist. And my other, my middle brother was uh, Murray. And he uh, was in the Navy, as I was. Uh, what did your dad do for a living? At the time I was growing up, my dad was in the laundry and dry cleaning business. Uh, Prior to that, uh, he, he came from Germany, and uh, he was educated in uh, various schools in Germany. Uh, he came from a long line of rabbis, and he had an excellent singing voice, so they, his parents felt that he, sh or actually his father, felt that he should be, uh, become a cantor. So they sent him to cantorial school in Germany. Uh, after a while, his voice changed, Though later on, he had became a marvelous baritone. But in, be in that interim of time, they no longer felt he was uh, qualified to stay in the Cantorial School. So he went to uh, a, a gymnasium, which is a college, and he studied chemistry. He became a chemist, uh, graduated, uh, and couldn't get a job in Germany because he was Jewish. So the, 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 there were threats of the war and they came, he came from, the, uh, uh, from Poland, from the Russian part of Poland. Yeah. And his father said they were starting to draft the Jews into the army, and that would be a fate worth in death for, for, young, uh, for a young Jew. And so he said, uh, you ought to go to, to America to your cousins in New Jersey, which he did. How did he get to America? He was a... Uh, he was qualified to be, they, he, there was a German ship, ship line, and uh, they, some of the ships had kosher kitchens. And because of his tr training, he was qualified to be a, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, supervised the, the kitchen to make sure that everything was kosher and properly handled. Yeah. And uh, he came to the United States, and uh, he had his uh, visa, he had his passport, and he stayed, and he st went to visit his cousins in New Jersey and stayed in New Jersey. He became a citizen about a year and a half later. Was he a veteran? No, he was not. He was married and had, had a my oldest brother at that time. Yeah. Did you graduate from high school? Yes. And what did you do after high school? I went to City College. And after I completed about a year of City College, I enlisted in the Navy. Now you mentioned you were, you, did you take, was it ROTC? I was ROTC in, the, in City College, yes. At City College of New York. CCNY as it's known. CCNY. Or was known. <laughs> and what year was that? Uh, I graduated in January of uh, 43 and I enlisted in the Navy in December of 43. At that time, high schools in New York had uh, graduations in June and January. And you said you enlisted, right? Yes. My mother had to sign the papers because I was uh, not quite 17. I was a month under 17 at the time. And I convinced my mother to uh, sign my enlistment papers. She was reluctant because my oldest brother had been 4F because he had a mastoid, uh, mastoidectomy. Uh, and, they, uh, and that time he was for, for because of the medical, he was yeah. 4F. But uh, he was a pharmacist and the uh, army needed pharmacists. So uh, he was no longer 4F and he was put into the army. And he, he wound up in England and Scotland. And my, uh, the, as I said before, my, uh, my other brother was in the Navy. He had been an uh, uh, airplane mechanic. He had, went, he had gone to the High School of Aviation Trades in Manhattan and uh, he got a job uh, with, his first job was at Wright Field in Ohio working for the, uh, in an army contract. I forget who the, uh, the contractor may have been Pan American, I, I don't know. But uh, he later signed on with Pan American as an airplane mechanic on a contract basis and he was being sent to Hawaii, and he was on his way to Pearl Harbor at the time Pearl Harbor was attacked. So he was out at sea. He was out at on sea his way. on his on a some sort of a uh, transport uh, on his way to Pearl Harbor. Very lucky. Uh, he was. We'll go back a little bit. Now you you enlisted. Uh, where did you enlist? In New York City. New York City, and into the Navy. Into the Navy. All right, you said you, you joined in, uh, your mother, mother had to sign signed papers. the papers in December. And, uh, you joined in December. And I was called, uh, called to active duty in, the, in January, in the, near the end of January, closer to my birthday. And you did say earlier that the reason you joined was because your brother was in the Navy also. Right. He was in the Navy. He was an uh, uh, enlisted man. He was, a, uh, as I said, an airplane mechanic. Yeah. Where were you sent for basic training? Great Lakes in, in Illinois. And we were in a, prior to my uh, being called up to active duty, I had taken a battery of tests with the Navy and uh, because I had passed what was called in the Eddy test, they asked, they s suggested I join the Eddy program, which I did. And that was a, uh, at that time it was a training program uh, where we would learn the, the ins and outs of radar, and we couldn't even talk about it at the time. It, it could, we, I didn't know that then, but uh, we went into a very abbreviated ba uh, boot camp at Great Lakes. How long was that? Uh, almost four weeks, as opposed to the ordinary length was the 12 weeks, I think it was at the time. Oh, okay. They made one, two things that they made us, that w they wanted to make us sure of, is one, they uh, wanted to make sure that we were able to uh, acclimate to the Navy, Navy way of doing things. And one of the things that they made sure that we did was we learned how to, f uh, at boot camp, was to fight fire aboard a ship. They had a simulated vessel with a, with a fire and make sure we knew what we were doing. Other than that, it was just basic ac athletics every morning, gym exercises and marching, parading. 
You mentioned something about the Great Lake. Uh, oh, Great Lake Shuffle. Yeah. Yes, that was uh, every. They have an inspection every Saturday morning, and on Friday night and Saturday morning we had to get the uh, barracks up to par, etc. And they did a, a white glove inspection to make sure there was no dust. But one of the things they concerned about was the floor had to be absolutely clean. clean. And what we did was we put steel wool on the floor, under, under our shoes, and we shuffled around on the floor to make sure that, every, that the floor was sanded perfectly clean with the steel wool. And that was called the, the Great Lakes Shuffle. And I'm going to ask you, and remind you anyway, how did you fare during the inspections? Well, we did very well. And uh, the second week we were there, we, we uh, got what all these other boot companies were trying to get. Uh, boot uh, was a, a rooster. Now, the rooster was a, like a, uh, an award for being the best. And we had to be the best in our marching, in our drill, and we had to be the best in our inspection at, of our barracks. And we learned after the first week that they came around with white gloves and they climbed up on ladders and touched the windowsills and they did everything. And so we knew. When the second we came, we were organized. I have to tell you the other thing, that our whole boot company were people who had taken the Eddie test and passed and were going go to go to, to training. Um, most of the people had at least one year of college, if not more. And so uh, it was an educated group of people and they didn't know how to get things organized. Yeah, yeah. And they did. And so that we made sure that we were, had no mistakes that second week. And lo and behold, we became Rooster Company. And uh, we were, lived in a barracks with two companies, one above us and the company above us. They were not, they were in a standard boot, com boot camp. And they were very envious of us and cast <laughs> remarks at us because here we were. They were in their fifth or sixth week of training. Here we were in our second week of training and we got the booster. And you got a, you got a two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. Yeah. And one other thing you mentioned, which I didn't realize, it's your uniform. Oh yes, when you got to boot camp, the first day, first night we got there, uh, we stepped on steel springs because they, they didn't have our barracks ready. We, this is the barracks we were going to be in, yeah. but we didn't have any any clothing or any anything. The next morning, very bright and early, we did some calisthenics. And then when they put us on a line where we signed a piece of paper saying, they, I forget how much money it was, we signed a piece of paper saying that we received this number of dollars from the U.S. Navy for our uniforms. And we, I did not know this until that time that we had to buy our uniforms. And uh, we, then we got on line, we held our arms out like this, and they just kept dumping, ask us what size we were, what, they, they looked at us, they, they guessed, and they just dumped stuff in our hands. And the next thing you know, my dress blues, my undress blues, my whites, all the uniforms that I ever would ever wear in the Navy were in my arms, including my dungarees and the chambray shirts and underwear and socks. When it came to the shoes, they had a problem. They didn't have my size. So I, I said, well, if you're not going to have my size, I want the money for the shoes. They said, <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. You'll come back. We'll get your shoes for you before you leave here. Was it hard to adjust to new life? Uh, initially, I, I, I really don't remember that it was hard. It was a, a matter of obeying orders. And uh, being, having been in the ROTC, I, I had a, an inkling of what it was going to be like. I knew how to take orders, uh, especially when you had uh, the specialist A's, as they were called, who trained us. They were all veterans. They had hash marks up their sleeves. They, all the years that they had served in the Navy. Uh, we had one who was a real southern boy and uh, he used to talk about when we did our inspections etc he had to take care of the light bulbs and we had no idea what he was talking about no one knew what he was saying he kept talking about light bulbs eventually it dawned on some of us and someone else and said yeah. he was talking about light bulbs oh <laughs> Now, you, you, you said you uh, attained a rank early. Oh, in, in, in boot camp, I was a, a camp. for two reasons. Uh, well, actually, one reason. I was the shortest man in the platoon, and as such, I was the guide on. And as the guide on, I had to have some rank, so I was an acting petty officer second class. Did you get any more money? 
No, I got a certificate, but that's all I got. <laughs> and you mentioned it was four weeks boot camp or four weeks of training. Right. Did you get a, a furlough after the basic training? No, we, we didn't. I, I don't ever recall getting any furloughs for the Navy. The best, the most that we got was the delay in transit. And when we were leaving uh, Great Lakes, we were told we were to, I was being assigned to, uh, to a uh, junior college in Chicago for my first part of, of electronic training. And they bused us from Great Lakes to the school. We dropped our stuff off at, at the school, uh, our hammocks and our, the, uh, the, uh, everything, the, 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 the mattresses that we had, the pillows. These were all, at the, well, this is what, everything that we got at the time when we, we bought our uniforms. And we would sign bunks. We put the stuff in our in that area, and then we were told we can, had a three-day delay in uh, transit. So we, being in from New York, I was able to get the overnight train to New York. It was a 20, 22 hour train. Yeah. What was it like coming home at that time? You know. At that time, my mother was very happy. Of course, she had a little little party for the relatives, see me in uniform, and. Uh, it was. Uh, you mentioned you also you uh, while you were home. I think it was is that, is that when you met up with your three buddies? Was it that? Time oh no no we had uh, they, I had enlisted at the time with three uh, two other buddies yeah. who were fraternity brothers of mine at City College in Phi Delta Pi fraternity, and uh, Norm Ru uh, uh, Roberts and uh, Howard Appleman, and uh, we all went to the same. Uh, uh, boot camp together. We were all in the same signed to uh, junior Herzl Junior College for our, f our first for four weeks of training. Uh, but we had been known each other at, at City College for about a year. Now you went to Chicago for the first for training. First training, right? Now, how many schools did you actually go to? I went to three schools. Three different schools. Yes. In the course of uh, six months. Six months. Sh it's, yes. Yeah. The Herschel Junior College for four weeks. Actually, for me, it was uh, extended because uh, there was a mumps epidemic going on in the Navy at the, in that area. And so quite a few of us wound up in the hospital. I was sent back to Great Lakes uh, in a, to be in a, in a isolation ward because the mumps were very contagious. contagious. And uh, when I came, when I was well, when they sent me back to uh, the Herschel Junior College, I had to wait until the another, class. another class had started or in, in the same phase that I was in. So I was there for two months. I should have been only one month. The next place I went to was uh, Del Monte, California. The Navy had taken over this luxurious uh, resort hotel. The hotel had two preheated saltwater swimming pools, tennis courts. Uh, the nicest thing of all was, of course, that uh, the contract that the Navy signed with the owners of the hotel, they had to keep all the employees uh, on, uh, on staff so that the employees would not lose their jobs. So in the dining hall, we had waitress service, but it was not individual waitress service. They would s serve the platters for uh, the pass around. It was family style platters. Yeah. And uh, we had linen service, a maid service, once a week, they, we had to strip the beds, and we, we went, went, out, went to classes. We came back uh, for lunchtime or in the evening when we came back after uh, the other classes. Uh, the beds were made, and we didn't have to do that again. So you lived fairly well out there. That's yeah, we, had, we lived in bunks. And they would, we, didn't have, we were in a suite. There were six of us in a, in a, in a suite with three bunk beds. And, wow. uh, but uh, it, it was, we were, oh yes, we, we were also on the ocean. So they, they had a private beach. So on uh, we, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, I would take a blanket and go down to the beach and, and do my studying on the beach. It was very pleasant. Nice, nice way to be in the Navy. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> my next school, after that, I was sent back to Chicago to Navy Pier. And that was for the advanced training program. And uh, that was where we did hands-on Actually, we did hands-on work at uh, Del Monte. At Al Monte, uh, there was a racetrack that the 
Navy had also taken over, which was a, we used to march to and from the racetrack. And what the Navy had done is they had, uh, under the stands, they had insulated the entire area under the stands with lead and copper, so that while we were doing our electronics studies and, yeah. and experiments and, <coughs> and, and laboratory work, learning how to work with radar, uh, none of the electronic signals would escape, so that uh, it could not be, no one on the outside would know what was going on inside. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's something else we did when we marched. Uh, we usually, they usually had put a, uh, an electronic flash on your arm, on your arm as an uh, indication of what you were. When we went to El Monte, we were given Cook's flashes, uh, Yeoman's flashes, all, so that no one would know that this was an electronic school. Now this was basically, as you mentioned before, top secret. It was top secret, as I was, I was we were informed that it was yeah. uh, secret stuff. It was radar. Radar was, and, and even at, the, at this point in time, it had been in use for a while, uh, for approximately six or seven months, or maybe longer than that, I don't know. But for our purposes, it was, uh, we were told everything we're doing here is secret, not to talk about it. All right, after all these, uh, schools and everything else. Where did you report to next? Uh, after we, I graduated, we completed training at uh, Navy Pier. Uh, we were given another delay in, in, in route. I went home and then I had my first airplane ride uh, at that time going from New York to San Francisco because I was the next base to report to was a Treasure Island in San Francisco. Now, talk about flying. It was an interesting thing because all my early life, when I was from a youngster on, I had always wanted to fly, be a pilot. Uh, when I was a, a kid, uh, about eight or nine, I guess it was, the New York Daily Mirror had a, uh, they were trying to promote flying. Yeah. And they had a, uh, uh, for children, for my age group, they had a group called the Junior Birdman of America. And I signed up, I, I sent away, and I got a card, and I got information back and forth, and I was making all kinds of models. As a matter of fact, when my brother was in Pearl Harbor, uh, a fact that I, I was, uh, people don't rec realize is that the, the planes that the Navy had uh, and that the Army had were all canvas-covered planes. They were not metal-covered planes. And so the, uh, because they have some of the wreckage, the, he was able to cut out the uh, star insignia that they, was on the aircraft, and he sent it to me, and I was able to put it up on my wall in my bedroom. Yeah, I was surprised to find out that they were canvas. Canvas cut <coughs> planes. How long did that star stay up on your wall? It stayed up there until I went into the Navy. My mother took it down then. <laughs> now, this is in July. It's been about, been about six months of school. A little after July, right, yeah. So it was just in July or early August. Now, when you first got to Treasure Island, you mentioned you, you had a little <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they didn't know what to do with us at first because they, we, had, we were waiting for a ship, and they didn't know. I had no idea what kind of ship was going to go on. And so the uh, next thing I know, I get called to do shore patrol duty. Now, here I am. Uh, shore patrol duty, and the, the, everybody there is, is, is I, to me, they were giants. They were only about 5'8", 5'10", 5'11", and uh, I'm on shore patrol. So I, I go, to, in, this is in San Francisco. I said, okay, how the hell am I going to be shore patrol? So the first thing they do is they, they gave me a, a belt with a, with a gun with a 45 on it, and so the first thing I did, I made sure there were no bullets in the gun. I took the clip out. <laughs> I said, if anybody's going to come c c take the gun, at least they can't shoot me. <laughs> How long were you on patrol? Two days. Two days. Yeah. That wasn't too bad. No, it wasn't too bad. But <laughs> the second day, they kept me inside. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, now you're, uh, right after that, you were assigned a ship? I was assigned to ship. I was assigned to the USS Pitt, APA-223. It was an attack patrol assault ship. It carried, uh, it was a Liberty vessel, uh, constructed on the West Coast, yeah. and it was like a freighter, but it carried 
uh, it was a troop transport, but it only didn't carry heavy troops. We carried about 150 uh, troops at, at the most at, at one time. And it had two LCIs, landing craft infantry, one on each side of the ship. And two, four batteries of AA guns and one four-inch gun in the rear. And uh, we were, at this point in time, being uh, not, not heavy training, but we were getting prepared for a uh, Japanese invasion. And one of the things that we were going to have to do is uh, either in the, I forget it was either the second or third wave, we had to carry this gigantic box carried by six people ashore, which was a portable microwave transmission system with an antenna that was inside this box that we had to assemble, put on the beach to establish communications between the beach and wherever else was going to go. We used to call it the coffin because it looked like a coffin. Yeah, and you said it carried, took six men to carry? Six men to carry, yeah. When you, you went from, from uh, Treasure Island, you went to Hawaii first. We went right? to Pearl Harbor Harry first. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And then from Pearl Harbor, it was a very interesting, very... Uh, oh, yeah. It was going into Pearl Harbor at that time was very... Uh, uh, we all st called, called, stood on deck at attention as we went through Pearl Harbor. With all the, the ships, though. All the ships. We could, they, they was, nothing had, they had cleared the channel so that ships could go in and out, but you could see all the wreckage that was there. And obviously, it's, it's still... Uh, this is before they built a platform on the Oklahoma and the rest of the city. Yeah. Well, it was a very uh, emotional experience. And, uh, but you got a lesson. Oh, I got a lesson. Yes, you I did. You got a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I had, the only car I had ever driven was a semi-automatic shift automobile. And uh, <clears throat> the captain, uh, we docked at Pearl Harbor and the ca I was on the uh, in the bridge at the time, and the captain had said, does anybody here know how to drive a car? And no one said anything. So he, he looked at me and says, do you know how to drive a car? I said, yes, I do, but it's, I only know how to drive a semi-automatic shift. I don't know how to drive a stick shift. He says, oh, that's no problem. He says, so anyhow, he says, I'm going I'm to take you with me. You're going to be my driver, and that's fine. And I'm his driver. We get down. He had a, he had acquired the ship had been back and forth in the Pacific before, yeah. and somehow or other he had acquired a jeep. I don't know how, but he had it. He acquired a jeep was in the hold, and they they hoisted. We had cranes to hoist material out, and they hoisted the crane out, and I'm on the on the dock, and waiting for the captain. He gets in. I start the engine, and I shift into first. Sort of. I I managed to get it into first, and I stalled. <laughs> And by the time, I stalled about at least three or four times, by the time I got to the end of the pier, the captain says to me, get out. So I didn't know what to do. I got out. He says, now get in on the other side. He says, I'll drive. <laughs> I thought he was going to have to make me walk back to, back to the ship again. I don't know what he wanted to do. But then he, he taught me how to drive, uh, showed me how to drive with a stick shift. So uh, by the time we got back to the ship, I was able to ma handle the, the, uh, the jeep. <laughs> Now, after you left Pearl Harbor, you were heading for... We picked up uh, troops. Yeah. Uh, Marines. No, I'm sorry. The first, the first uh, patch of troops we had, we had were Army personnel. You picked them up at Pearl at Harbor? At Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, we went out to another island and we dropped them off. We were primarily moving supplies and men back and forth between a couple, several islands, and that's what we were doing. Sometimes they were army troops, sometimes they were marines. But all the islands that we visited at that time had all been secured. So I did not see any combat at that time. At one point in time, we were in the, in the Pacific, and uh, a Mitsubishi, we, didn't saw, we, uh, we saw a plane overhead. It was identified as a Mitsubishi. General alarm was, uh, quarters were sounded, and we all went to, the, to our placements, our different uh, stations. One of mine was a, at this particular time, when I was not on radar duty, I was assigned to a gun. I was on an AA battery. And for some reason, I was, I didn't usually shoot, but I was 
asked to, not asked, but I guess if I, I just said, no one wanted to be the gunner, so I said, I'll be the gunner. Yeah. <clears throat> and we were shooting at this, which we then identified as a Mitsubishi fighter plane. And he circled overhead a couple of times, and we were shooting, and uh, he took off. Get into the, one of the, while I was shooting, the gun jammed, one of the shell, one of the uh, casings, it, it didn't eject properly. It bounced around, hit me in the jaw, knocked, cracked the tooth in my jaw, gave me some other damage, minor damage, but it was still, and I had it, I mean, <coughs> when it was all over, the uh, corpsman aboard ship says, there's nothing you can do except pull the tooth. So he, I said, pull the tooth, because it was in pieces anyway. They cleaned it out. But we were concerned because here we were in the Pacific. We were not part of any sort of a fleet. We were all by ourselves. And we didn't know whether he felt that the, this pilot who saw us knew that we were just uh, one, ship. one ship. He knew that. He didn't know whether he was going to waste uh, shooting back at us or, or torpedo us or whether he was going to notify a submarine to come get us because I had, we were concerned. I can imagine. We were a little, little nervous about traveling around at that point. We were Actually, we were never part of any fleet. We never, uh, at one point in time, uh, when we were, uh, another point, was a bad, bad time, we hit a storm. We were in a typhoon. Yeah. And uh, uh, we had canvas hatch covers co that covered the, the interior of the ship, the, where the, the docks were, where the supplies were. Yeah. And at one point, the wind and the storm was so severe, it blew one of the hatch covers off, and we started taking water, because we, we were going to the typhoon, the captain was going through the waves. In other words, you either, either go with slide into the waves and you get swamped, or you go through the waves and you stay afloat. Yeah. But we were shipping, the, water. Oh, the water was, it hit, <coughs> the waves were, were higher than the mass. They were coming in. We uh, had to go in afterwards and make sure the, the uh, all the air, radar that we had aboard ship was, uh, that the antennas was, was more properly fixed. But we were getting a ship and the ship started to list and we were all getting nervous at that time also, concerned about the pumps operating properly. But we, we got through it. It had to be helpful scary though. I mean, I it was scary. Uh, it's one interesting because when we were kids and the war was on and we used to talk with, in school in high school and, and with my street friends. And we used to talk about, hey, would you rather be in the Army, the Navy, the Marine? We'd talk about just all these kind of things. And uh, I, the general consensus was you'd rather be in the Army because they could find your body and at least bury you. Even the Navy, you were lost. Here I am in the Navy. Just, and at, at, at this typhoon was coming on, and we were in it. I said, oh my God, why am I here? <laughs> Thought you chose, chose the wrong, <laughs> wrong service. Yeah. And so after your island happened for a while, transporting troops, and you mentioned that uh, in June, June of, no, June of 44. No, 45 probably. 45, I mean. Uh, you, were, you were headed to Shanghai? Yes. We, the, uh, we ran into Shanghai. We were... Uh, uh, we're up the Yangtze River, yeah. And uh, they, when you went into Shanghai, there was no, there was a dock, but your ship could not dock at at, at the at the dock. You moored. They had uh, cables and buoys in the middle of the channel, and they signed you to hook up fore and aft to a buoy. So you're there front and back, and there were ships in the, on, along this lo this line, and. Uh, what they, if you had to move, pe move uh, troops ashore uh, or supplies ashore, it was done by uh, other craft that came in and... Uh, smaller craft. Smaller craft, and yeah. you would load your stuff for, into these smaller craft. Now, the captain had a uh, small uh, motor launch, I would call it. It was a... Uh, had a small, small bridge, small cabin, small cabin on, uh, that was for his service, and... Uh, uh, again, uh, I happened to be in the bridge at that time again, in Shanghai, uh, and uh, I was assigned to the, to the captain's gig to get ashore. How the captain was going to go ashore, and what you did was you, you had a 
a rope or a lead in your hand and you threw it to the dock and there was another sailor on the dock who would fasten it and wrap it around the, the, the pier so they, you could dock properly. Yeah. Well, as he's pulling the, the, as I throw it to him and he's pulling it out, my foot got caught in it and I wound up in the Yang Sea, taking a bath in the Yang Sea. Not, not a pleasant bath. Well, the first thing they did was they, they pulled me out, of course, and then they put me in, back in the gig, in the back part of the gig, and they loaded, the, the, the captain got off and what had to do, what they were what, what they doing. They took me right back to the ship again, put me back into uh, sick bay, took my clothes off, disinfected me thoroughly, gave me three shots because the Yangtze was a very polluted river. It was full of uh, feces, uh, garbage, all the, everything, the sewage, everything was in it. So, uh, so they, they were afraid that you were going to... They, they, they would just took the precaution to yeah. make sure that nothing would happen to me. Because I, I, they asked me if I swallowed anything. I said, I don't think so. I hope not, I said. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that was, it was nothing. It turned out to be uh, just an incident. How long, you were only, were you in there for about a week or two? If I I'm sorry? How long were you at Shanghai? For about a week? Oh, about a week. About uh, a week just maybe not quite a week. And then we went up further north uh, on the Yangtze to another a naval base. Uh, we stood there for two days. I think we, we dropped some supplies off for them there. That's all we did there. So we were there for about a two days. But we, uh, while we were in Shanghai, we, we, had li we were given liberty in Shanghai. Uh, part of the ship at a time. Part of our... Uh, the, the cruise quarter. Yeah. And uh, interesting thing, that, uh, before we got to Shanghai, several members of the crew who had been on the ship before uh, for a while, they knew, they, when they knew they were going to Shanghai, they went to the ship stores, PX, to buy up all the Parker 51 pens that, that they could and cigarette cartons and things like that. And I didn't know what the heck they were doing because they knew that they, when they got ashore, they could go to the black market and trade these things. They, could, they had, uh, obviously, since they had been there before, they knew what, what they were doing. Uh, and that's what they did. And they would tape the, the cotton cigarettes in, on their legs, up their arms, under their blouses, and uh, had wristwatches, three or four wristwatches on their arms, parked at 50 ones, all that. And they came back with uh, American currency, if they could get it. Uh, but what we found out that uh, the inflation rate was so high in Shanghai, in China, that the money was tied up in bundles and weighed. And we were in, a, in one of these shops trying to get something, and we saw that what the shop owner did was he leafed through the package to make sure that it was all money, all money, and not paper. And then he put it on a scale and weighed, it, and based upon how much it weighed, that's how that's how they handle it, and it it. it He's uh, talking, uh, many of the shop, or at least the shop owners that we went to, spoke English, very broken English, but they yeah. spoke in English. And they talked about how horrible it was. And I had a Timex watch on my, on my watch, and he wanted to buy my Timex watch. I said, I, I, I'm not going to sell you my Timex watch because he says, I, first of all, I don't want that, that paper money. It wasn't any good to you. No, I couldn't no. Have used it in any place. Uh, we, what we did when we wanted the, when we were in Liberty, what we did, we went to the, uh, there was a Red Cross station and uh, we had a, they had a restaurant there and we had, first I had water buffalo steak. Really? Yeah. Well, any good? Well, it was steak. <laughs> <laughs> they also had a, uh, uh, <coughs> again, this was at the Shanghai racetrack, the army had established, made it a PX under the stands. And it was a gigantic PX. They could buy almost anything with American money. And they got American money back. And uh, the people who were working there were German women who had been in, with in Japan, in China, in Shanghai, as part of the German uh, I don't know, community who lived there, I don't know yeah. what it was. And so they worked there as, as clerks. Hey, when you left Shanghai, you know, after you, when you came down the river, now you're back out, you were... In the Pacific. Trans ...transporting troops again? Yeah, we, with supplies, mostly so We with transported supplies. troops. Uh, we did transport troops, but coming out of Shanghai, well, it was, we were just uh, uh, supplies. 
We still had supplies that we couldn't load to some, at some other islands. We stopped off at some islands where we did not have, uh, not with any troops, but just dropping off supplies again. And uh, at one point, at one of the islands, I, I don't know which one it was, they uh, had a stacks of Japanese rifles and uh, bayonets, which we could take. They were captured weapons? They were captured wep weapons, which we were able to take. But the uh, firing pins had all been altered by the... Uh, the, uh, the armory? By the armory, oh. so that they could not be used as weapons anymore. But the bayonets could be used. And the, interestingly enough, the uh, bayonets which I still have. I have the, the gun. I, uh, I gave it away to somebody. I forget who it was now. But the, I kept the bayonet because the bayonet was, had never been used, apparently, because it still had the, uh, what do you call that grease that they put on that stuff? I know, I, I know what you're... Yeah, they were, it, st it still had the original grease on it, but it had a little tag on it with the Japanese uh, insignia, on, Japanese letters, letters on it, which we found out later was the name of the soldier who had had that that bayonet. Oh, really? Yeah. How long was it? Just for my, you know, information. How long was the bayonet? Was it these long ones? Standard or? bayonet. It was one that was you fixed to a rifle to a. Uh, the Japanese rifle. I mean, Japanese I, rifle. I think yeah. those were longer than ours, though. Yes, they? they were. Yeah. So now you're. You, you're still you're you're out in the Pacific, and is this this is when you? Uh, this is when we knew we were was getting ready for the getting ready for go to Japan. Go to Japan, and we were going to pick. We were assigned to pick up some troops. This we found out through the scuttlebutt. A lot, a lot of scuttlebutt up in the aboard ship. You know, no one knows what's going on. You hear this information. Someone in the radio shack heard something and tells it. Again, but any news is better than no news. So. Right. So we were listening. We knew that we heard, and we were getting, again, we were getting ready uh, to pick up some troops to get ready for an invasion. And then we heard the news that the uh, Japanese had been bombed, the atomic bomb had been dropped on Japan, and the uh, war was over for us. How did you feel? I mean, knowing that you were going in, possibly never coming back to we, the war is over. It was a... Uh, Frankly, it was a great relief for everybody. <clears throat> I can imagine. Everybody, no one spoke about it much before. We all knew, I shouldn't say we all knew, we had some idea of what was going to happen if we got into a landing. And the ship was going to be used, and then apparently it was going to be used in the landing. Yeah. From what we had, we are going to have troops, and we are going to carry the troops into Japan. So uh, uh, when it was over, when the war was ended, people who started, the guys aboard ship started talking about it, how relieved they were, how, thank God, type of thing. Yeah, I can imagine. So now your ship just turns around? Then we got the orders, going back to San Francisco, we're gonna and get discharged. That was August of uh, 45. 45. So you landed back in uh, Treasure Island. Other and then we took us back to Treasure Island. And uh, we were there for two or three days at the most, I think. Uh, about two or three days. Uh, I don't really re recall specifically. And then we were put on a troop transport, on a, a railroad, right. a, ra a train a transport. And uh, we went through Mexico. They, through the sudden, the way the train tracks went, I don't know why, but we went through a certain part of Mexico on our way through Texas, and uh, gradually wound up. Uh, we were on that troop transfer for almost a week to get from San Francisco, from Treasure Island to uh, Long Island. We, we went to Lido Beach. Was, the, was it crowded on the train? It was full. Full. I mean, we all had a, uh, uh, a place to sleep. Yeah. But it was it was full. There was no. no they ran out of food on on the train. Really? Yeah. Oh, I mean, they, they did get food somewhere, somehow. We got some rations, yeah, but they ran out of they ran out of everything. We got when we got to where was it? I forget where some I forgot what city it was. We got to, and there was a, a, a Red Cross. So they were selling that's giving selling coffee to us. 
can't believe that. So you, you, got, you got back to Lido, Lido Beach, Long Island. Right. And this is where you were discharged from. Right. Navy had taken over this hotel, a luxury resort hotel in, in Long Island, Lido Beach. And they had, it was a, uh, an embarkation point at one point. Now it was a, they had converted it to a uh, debarkation point where we all went through. Our, we were there for a day and a half. And we got discharged from the Navy at that point gave us um, uh, a money allotment based upon where you lived, took us to the Long Island Railroad Station, and we were, on, we were on our way home. Now, you mentioned when we talked earlier about being one of the last units to be discharged. Oh, we were the last unit to be discharged because the you people... were the last unit. We were the last unit because the, the, the uh, crew, the personnel at Lido Beach, they were discharging themselves as, as we went through we, as being the last group to be used to to be discharged from this from that processing center, they were discharging themselves. And uh, right after we left, they closed the doors. <laughs> wow. Do you have any memories of that particular day, the day you were discharged itself? Not. I, I'm think you didn't ask me this question before, so I didn't have a chance to think about it. Uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, I'm thinking about it now. I, I really, uh, I can't say that I, that I had any sort of special recollection of that day, except that I knew I was out. How did you feel coming home? The day oh, you know, once you oh, got discharged? Oh, that, you that, that you did ask me that. I was very, very glad to get home. Very happy to be out, very happy to... Be, to, to be gone, to have the Navy. Well, I have to say one thing. I, I, I really felt that my Navy experience was, was wor worthwhile. I'm not dismissing it in any manner whatsoever. I think yeah. it, I, 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 uh, I thought it was, it, I did my bit. I think I, I, uh, I hoped I did my bit for, the, for our war effort. Uh, I felt proud about that point. I also felt that I did my, the best that I could in, in my, for, my, for the country and for the Navy and for myself. And I think the Navy did well, did well for me too. And I appreciated that also. And, uh, but I was, also, I was glad to be out. You also mentioned a club that you joined. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think just about everybody joined. Yeah, I, I was very happily uh, informed by my neighbors who had already come back before I did. Uh, there's a such a thing as a 5220 club. What does that mean? Well, you get $20 a week for 52 weeks. You go down and claim that you're looking for a job, but you're not looking for a job, whatever. But you got $20 a week for, the, for, for a year to help you get acclimated back to the States again. But I was going back to school anyway. I knew that. But yeah. I, didn't, I just didn't know what I was going to do. I was just going to ask you, was it hard to adjust back to the civilian life? And, and you I, it was, because at one point... Uh, when I started City College and before uh, I did anything else, I thought I had planned pre-med, pre that type of thing. Uh, but after being working with electronics in the Navy, I said I, I'm going to use my Navy training, and I became an electrical engineer. So and you, you didn't go back to school after? I went after the 5220 situation. Uh, I went back to school, became an electrical engineer. And I went up, after that, I went up to Syracuse University and got a master's degree. Uh, and, uh, so you did take, take advantage of the GI oh, Bill Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The GI Bill was marvelous. You said you got your master's, doctor, a bachelor's and doctorate? No, I, mean, I, masters, got, I, masters. I got part of my doctorate, but I, didn't, yeah. I never completed it. What did you do for a living? Well, my first job was... Uh, Based because of my uh, my uh, electronic work, I was uh, looking for a job, obviously, and I got a job uh, at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx with a group of cardiologists who were using radioactive isotopes or experimenting with radioactive uh, radioactive isotopes on cardiac patients with different medications that they were using to see how. And the, uh, my job was to test the uh, 
amount of radiation, not the test, but the, the, the material that was used, the radiation material that was used, had to be measured before it was used and after it was reclaimed from the urine and from other, from the, uh, primarily the urine of the patients. And it was my job, uh, again, we worked with, with, with lead, lead, uh, lead, Covers lead, 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 and, uh, aprons. Aprons. And, and hand, special gloves. And everything was put into a, 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 a vault, a lead lined vault, so that everything was, uh, no leaks of radiation. But we had to account for all the material that was being used so that none of it went astray. And that was my first job. Was it, was it dangerous if it went astray? I mean, or? It, it was not so, I, I don't know whether it was. Medically or? or? It was not, re it was, it, 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 could have, it could be dangerous. But it was radioactive. And that at that time, uh, and again, I did this, some of this came from my master's work uh, using uh, radioactive, uh, radioactive material. But uh, uh, it, it was, it could be dangerous, put it that way. But the, yeah. the safest thing was to make sure that it was all accounted for. Yeah. I had then applied, I, I had originally also applied for a job at Bell Telephone Labs. Uh, and they're doing this until I heard from them. And I heard from Bell Telephone Labs, and I heard from them indirectly. I heard from Western Electric. Western Electric at that time was the parent company with AT&T of uh, Bell Labs. They had received my application, and they wanted to know uh, if I'd be interested in working for Western Electric instead of Bell Labs. I said, I went for the interview, and uh, they made me a very nice offer, and I went to work for Western Electric as an electrical engineer, as an equipment engineer in electronics. And I stayed there for 35 years. I was just going to ask you how long. 35 years. Wow. Now, I did, I did many things, though. I'm sorry. No, got, that's okay. You, I know you, you did an awful lot of different I jobs. Started, I, I did. I was in engineering. I was in public relations. I was in labor relations. Uh, I was assistant editor for the, of the engineer magazine in public relations. Uh, wrote articles, traveled all around the, all to the, our different plants, talking to engineers who had articles to submit. The engineer magazine was a, had worldwide subscription. Uh, it was a very, very uh, sought after publication by schools and other industries, other companies. Did you write any articles or? My basic, my, I wrote a few articles, but my basic assignment was to help the engineers who had the ideas who were for the articles, help them write their articles. Okay. And to uh, put it in shape for publication, get the artwork done properly. and uh, That's quite a career. Yes. I want to go back a little bit to your, when you were eight or nine years old, and oh. you mentioned you, know, you, you, wanted to, you always wanted to fly. Yes. So now you're, I think it was around 40? Around 40, I decided it was time. <laughs> I hadn't, I, I, I had flown many places, but now I wanted, and matter of fact, at one point in time, when I was uh, working for the company, uh, I used to fly to, to uh, from New York to Andover, Massachusetts, and the plant was in Lawrence, and I used to, they used to I either rented a car or they had a car waiting for me to take me back and forth. And one time I said, I was in Boston, I said, no, let, let me see if I can fly, get a fly, one of these small planes. And so I uh, f investigated, and there was, a f there was a service that flew from Boston to, to Lawrence and to Andover and these other different places up in Massachusetts. And uh, I, s I checked with the company, said, it's okay to take one of those planes. And I took one of the planes and uh, several times that from that point on, and I would sit with the pilot and he'd let me hold the controls. And uh, uh, So then I come back, I said, I'm gonna fly. So I went and took the physical that you had to take and uh, went out to, I was taking lessons out in the, the uh, MacArthur Airport at that time. It was not MacArthur Airport, it was a different name, it was the flight uh, airport for Republic Aircraft, the, the uh, Public uh, aircraft company. Yeah, but they had one area that was was open to the public, and they had private lessons there. And I was taking lessons. I was going to fly. And then my wife said to me, uh, 
No, you're not. <laughs> she said, it's too dangerous, so after taking a few, uh, it's five lessons, and I was going up in the air with the plane, and I, she said, no, 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 I'm too nervous, it's too much, and I stopped flying. But you at least got your lessons, and you got up in the plane for a while. Yeah. So you almost fulfilled your Almost childhood. fulfilled my... my uh, <laughs> Did you marry and have a family? Yes. Did you keep in touch with your buddies or attend any reunions? The only, not, no, not the only buddies I really kept in touch with were the, my fraternity brothers who I went into the Navy with and they came out. Uh, incidentally, it was interesting. On this troop train, uh, met one of the guys, I, one of the, uh, with Norm, Norm Roberts, uh, who had, uh, gone into the Navy with me. And we were on this troop train going from San, from San Francisco back to New York. And uh, I hear this voice, and I recognize the voice, and it's Norm. So there we were. We had gone in on the same day. We got out on the same day. Yeah, I mean, you, you were on a, uh, the he same was, car or whatever. No, we're not. We, 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 he was a different different car. Different car? You just, just walking. The, you, you know, you're on this train. You, you want to... Oh, you, that's right. You can walk through walks, the car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organization? Yes, I joined the Jewish War Veterans. One other question I'd like to ask you. Do you feel that your service experience had a positive or negative effect on your life? I, as I indicated before, I, I would it's definitely positive, very, very positive for me. Well, Joe, I'd like to thank you for your service and for the time that you give us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure.